Hello everyone. Thanks very much for joining me today on the Marketing Resolution YouTube channel. My name is Natalie Armstrong Moton and I'm in Normandy, France, but I'm lucky enough to be chatting to a colleague of mine in Ireland. This is Bill Hollihan. Hi Bill, how are you? Getting older and hopefully wiser. Uh, well, the older bit we can't help, the wiser though, in your case, is a certainty. So thanks very much for joining me today. Um, you have an incredible bio, uh, enormous amount of experience. Um, I mean, you've got an alphabet soup behind your last name that is absolutely impressive, not to mention authoring eight books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your, your bio goes on and on and on, so really impressive. And I know that for you, bringing all of that experience, bringing all of those different filters and all of the different hats that you've worn over a, a lifetime career is what makes you such a unique practitioner. So I was wondering if you could explain to the viewers a little bit about who you are and what you do and, and how you do it, maybe even who some of your, your clients, without divulging details, but who your, your typical client might be okay um, I am now 59 heading for 60 uh, hopefully not feeling the effects of getting older uh, I was intended in life to become an accountant because I used to get straight A's in math as the Americans would call it but and I had an uncle who had no sons and who uh, had an accountancy practice so that I was close to him the presumption was that I was going to become an accountant. And one day in class, a teacher figured that I was taking notes rather too carefully. So he came over, pulled out the piece of paper, looked at it and said, Hulan, if that's what turns you on, become a lawyer. And I was making up an agreement to give a loan of a book to a friend of mine sitting next to me. Um, and then I signed up for a six night course on law for the citizen. Uh, and that opened up something and I just said, yep, that's for me. So I went off, studied, uh, went to school. in Ireland, we go to uh, university first, then we go into professional training. Uh, while I was doing my professional training after getting my first degree, I did a second degree, um, ended up doing a thesis in shipping law because uh, two ships bashed into each other in Cork Harbour and the office I worked for were the lawyers for the Harbour Commissioners. I uh, went to the Academy of International Law in The Hague for a while. Um, then. Uh, qualified as a solicitor, as they're called, the, the official title is solicitor and attorney in Ireland, but uh, in the British Isles they refer to them as solicitors, but also uh, we are uh, attorneys. I then started off, and every three to four years I've kind of wandered into a different area of practice, and through good fortune or otherwise, I've ended up doing various things, getting involved in various kind of professional organisations, um, and ending up writing eight books. But I now describe myself as a repentant lawyer who, having worshipped in the satanic church of mediation for 25 years, found the one true church of mediation. And that, like a lot of evangelists uh, who would come knocking on the door saying, We have come by Jesus, uh, practitioners in Ireland would say, And by Jesus, you can go. But now, after 13 years, they're beginning to listen. Um, we have legislation now in Ireland since last year putting mediation on a statutory footing. So in one sense, they have to learn about it, they have to know about it. I'm already uh, acting for defendants in two cases, had two cases non-suited, i.e. thrown out of court because of failure to advise in accordance with a statutory obligation now for lawyers in Ireland to advise about the benefits and the advantages of mediation. And the difficulty with those two cases being thrown out is, one, they can come back again. It was just that particular suit was thrown out. But the other is now statute barred and has resulted in a negligence action against the lawyer involved, all because they didn't go and worship in the one true church of mediation. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's you got to believe us when we tell you that this is the best thing since sliced bread. So I, um, I want to... What, what did the baker who uh, you know, presented the sliced loaf to his employer. What did the employer say? This is the best thing since, um, since um, <laughs> what was before sliced bread? Little green anyway. apples? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it would be, but, but it's what we use now as the, the benchmark. Yeah. Um, 
so so you you have all of this different experience as a business person as an advocate as a as a mediator as a citizen as all of these different things and so you bring all of those different components of your experience into your hearing rooms um does does that mean that you are an evaluative mediator are you a facilitative mediator um how do you how do you okay. best help your clients okay you have to try to relate to the client now i am as well as being a practicing lawyer a stroke mediator i'm an notary public i am a trademark agent i'm an eu trademark practitioner i'm a director and shareholder of over 20 companies most of them as you can tell by quite obviously looking at me in the fitness industry believe it or not um but you pick up kind of life experiences as you go that allow you to relate to people and empathy is the most important uh, skill that a mediator could possibly have and over years ago i had a dispute involving three insurance companies where i was acting for one of the insurance companies involved uh, who were indemnifying various parties and they with some difficulty i persuaded my colleagues to agree to go to mediation and one of them said, oh, we now need a senior counsel. That would be the equivalent of Queen's counsel in the UK, a highly expert uh, trial lawyer in, in the US terms, uh, who would be a specialist in insurance law. And I said, that's the last thing we need. In this we actually need, because there's a, a citizen bringing a claim, I said, we need an empathic mediator. And the mediator had no law training whatsoever. In fact, he started life as a fitter um in terms of uh, you know the building trade uh but he was a great mediator and still is so you, you have to try and build a bond with people and sometimes you have to challenge people you know when someone says but i am right and i said how long have you been involved in this conflict five years so how is right and being right working out for you uh you know and i have another phrase that i use let's not dwell on matters hysterical they tend to become matters hysterical uh, and it's a question of trying to, to work out what will resonate with people. Sometimes, um, you know, you have to tell people that they are being bold, they are being childish, they are being unreasonable, and that they're perfectly entitled to go on being childish or unreasonable, but what will it profit them? Um, and you, you have to try and get people to see at times the absurdity of that position. So sometimes I'm evaluative, sometimes I'm quite challenging. Uh, Sometimes I'm, sometimes I will simply listen, uh, simply because someone will talk themselves out. And I've had a situation recently in mediation where someone has kept on talking to fill the silence and eventually said, that sounds incredibly stupid, doesn't it? And I didn't say anything, I was just, mm. <laughs> and they realized themselves. You know, so it, it, it's different tactics depending on the people you're, you're dealing with. It, it's horses for courses. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about being a mediator is that it requires a hybrid of art and science. You know, so we've been given the blueprint for these fantastic processes, but then there, there's the human component, and that requires us to be a bit of an, of a, an artist and decipher humans and their intentions and their motives and uh, and sometimes we hear what they say sometimes we look at their face when they say what they say and recognize that they don't actually believe what they're saying or they don't they don't like what they're saying uh, so it, it requires us to to be um, artists to a great degree and it sounds like because of your varied and vast background and experience you're able to establish trust and and confidence with your clients rather quickly and, and therefore get them to resolution um, the way i describe it is you need to understand what makes people tick and what makes people think and there's more of a hitch than the, you know all of the difference and i give a good, a good example a number of years ago there was a very successful company multi-million turnover two brothers 10 years difference in age the older brother was the finder, the uh, younger brother was the minder. Now they all had a winder and a grinder. To understand the meaning of the expression, the finder, the minder, the grinder, and the grinder. 
finder sales, bring them in. Doesn't need to know anything about the business, just good PR, the Rotary Club, Golf Club, whatever it is, bring them in. The minder, customer support, service, etc., looks after them when they're in the door. The winder is what I call the do you want fries with that. Uh, you know, if, if you're starting up in business as a lawyer, you, you'd say to somebody, oh, you need a will because all this hard work will kill you, or you might go insane in the meantime, so we better get an enduring power of attorney, and you're hiring people, we'll need contracts of employment. That's the, you want fries with that. And the winder is the homicidal, anti-social, sociopath, keep in the back room, give them loads of work, but never let them talk to anybody. And uh, there's a bit of that in all of us. But uh, the, the older brother was the finder, the younger brother was the minder. Uh, he was the numbers guy, almost on the spectrum, very serious, everything was a spreadsheet. And suddenly the younger brother, this is a company operating in Ireland, the younger brother um, suddenly announced, uh, oh, I want to sell up, I'm going to move to the States and set up a new business in the States. And the older brother said, why? He said, oh, the business has peaked, there's no more growth, uh, this is the end of it. And the older brother said, Nonsense, it was another 20 years. They then started exchanging memos. Now, the older brother was a one page man, the younger brother was a 40 page memorandum, graphs, spreadsheets, full of data man. Uh, so they weren't communicating. <clears throat> and just before a petition was to be presented to the High Court here in Ireland to wind up the company, resulting in a fire sale which had crashed the value, and lots of people would have lost their jobs, they decided to mediate. And I got my co author on the book, Keith Kelleher who's actually a quantity surveyor, but a very good mediator. I got him in and we did a bit of a tag team exercise and we swapped around between the two of them. But it was a question of getting to know them first and getting them to trust us. And the younger brother revealed the real reason he wanted to cash in. He was in his 40s. He had married at 39. He and his wife had gone through six sessions of IVF. Now one would be grueling and expensive. Six was devastating and hideously expensive but unsuccessful. In Ireland, he figured, rationally, it's going to take me seven years to go through the adoption board approval process. At which point, because of less and less intra-country adoption, there won't be any children available in Ireland. And I will be in my 50s, and I'll be running out of eligibility years in Ireland. Whereas if he went to the States, set up in business, well, the NSA might live with him for two years. Uh, if he gets through that process, he'd have a child in the house in 18 months to 24 months. And so, but he couldn't tell his older brother. He was afraid of telling his older brother and being rejected. Mm. So he had gone through this big exercise of memos and spreadsheets and graphs to justify his request. He asked me, would I communicate? I did, and the older brother said, oh my God, of course, like, that's what we have to do. But you know, let's explore other options. And we came up with an option because they owned various properties that they were operating on it, they sold those, leased them back, generated a pot of cash in the company, paid that out by way of sharing redemption to the younger brother, who got his nest egg, went to the States, set up what is now a thriving business in the States, and he has two kids. Uh, the older brother, five years later, the two of them decided they're going to smell the roses. Uh, and they cashed in for five times the, the book value at the time of the aviation, which would have been halved in the liquidation. Um, now that's a complete win-win. But where in the dusty halls of a courtroom, in the context of what we call a chance reaction to wind up a successful company, does the desire to have a child teach you? It doesn't. And that's the beauty of mediation. Yeah. That is uh, one of the most perfect examples of why to not litigate and why to mediate a case, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard a more perfect anecdote to support the reason that, um, that people ought to really consider using uh, one of the resolution processes that you offer. So, well, Bill, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I know that um, you've got a really dynamic website that if someone Googles your name, they're going to come up with all kinds of resources. They can find your books, your articles, your, I mean, it, the list just goes on and on and on and on about you, um, which is fantastic, really, for our industry and, and for your clients. I'm proud to call you a colleague and thrilled that you joined me here today and, uh, and look forward to talking to you again. And hopefully I'll get to interview you about uh, one of your books soon. Anytime. Okay.
Yeah, thanks good. very much, Bill. I really appreciate it. Oh, and everyone, please don't forget, subscribe, like, and share. And for more information about Bill and his books, of course, I'll put the uh, web information in the description bar so you'll be able to contact him and, and connect directly. Thank, very, thank you very much, Bill. And uh, to everyone else, be good humans. Take care.